But my question is, if you can't stop an, an addiction, but you can stop or change a habit, there's some other ingredient. Why can't you stop an addiction? Well, you can't stop an addiction. It happens every day. People stop using a substance that creates a lot of pain for them. The key is to get in touch with what it is what's causing all the pain, the anxiety. I think people want to use a substance because, well, what I know about addictions um, is that the brain has this anxiety. It's, it's got this perceived threat, and what happens is that it looks for some kind of way to tranquilize that feeling. So take a substance. And maybe the brain, the first time it, it, it consumes alcohol and you calm down, the brain says, wow, alcohol solves my problems, even though it hasn't solved a darn thing. Uh -huh. But it's certainly taken away that physical feeling, that anxiety. So the next time that anxiety for now. comes... For, for now. now. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So the next time that anxiety comes back, what works? Well, alcohol works. So take some more alcohol. When this goes on, it gets progressive. And before you know it, there's problematic behavior going on because this person, that state of ang anxiety is never going away. The more they consume, the anxiety still kind of creeps up through this fog they're trying to create. They start losing everything. Um, I'll use a, a man for an example. He goes to the bar every day after work to, re to relieve his anxiety. Stressful day, stressful marriage, stressful kids, blah, blah, blah. Just making this stuff up so that he can have his drug of yeah. choice. And um, comes home, and there's a letter there, and the house is empty. And the letter says, we've had enough of you, you effing blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we're gone. And so what does that person do at that point? Goes back to the bar to get some more substance. You know, so in spite of everything that's going on, there's a, it's like Carol mentioned, you know, the, in spite of all the consequences, there's no relation between the consequences and and uh, the behavior. The reason why people use a substance is because it works. In spite of all the consequences that are presenting themselves, to them it still works. If you, take, if you tell an alcoholic to quit drinking, you're basically asking them to cut off their dominant arm. So unless they have something to replace that, and that's where you get people to start thinking in terms of um, what would be your life be like if you gave up this? What could you do instead? What gets in the way of that? And just think, you know, those questions bring up a lot of tabloid issues. And any fears that they have about moving forward or looking at another alternative other to the one that they're using, um, like these are all issues that, that you can tab on. Great. You know, but people, you know, you got to have something to replace it. You, if you have a void, the, the, the universe abhors any kind of vacuum at all. Absolutely. So you make sure that you've got something to replace that. I want to tell you how I got into EFT. I was an addiction counselor, and uh, I noticed that everybody there, you know, I got into addictions as an addiction counselor because I wanted to give back what I took. I had my own problems and stuff like that. So when I got into addiction counseling, what I recognized was that everybody that was coming in for treatment, and I worked in a residential, it was an inpatient treatment program, and that's a place where you take a grown adults and you turn them into children, okay? And if anybody that works in the system, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, I noticed that the people who were coming in were traumatized. If you could keep them clean for 90 days and give them a psych evaluation, you'd find out that there, a lot of them were suffering, and the majority of them would be suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder. Something was going on. And uh, I got interested by that, so I started learning about trauma. In the process of learning about trauma, I ended up becoming a trauma specialist. And one of the courses I took in my journey was an EFT course. And I was absolutely blown away by the results that I saw. I was working with a woman who had an incredible fear of driving over railroad tracks. And she was in her mid to late 50s. She's had this fear for her whole driving career. And I watched EFT resolve that issue. And I was part of that. And it was resolved in less than 20 minutes. And I thought, wow, this is very cool. I want to do more of this. And I went back and I started tapping on everybody, my family, friends, the people in the treatment center when I was allowed to do it because I had to do it kind of secretly. Uh, I tapped on the dog. I tapped on everything. And I kept learning and I kept learning. And um, eventually here I am today, uh, still learning. <laughs> anyway, one of the things that uh, I noticed 
Well, first of all, what we learned at the addiction center, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy seemed to be the thing to do. And what happened is these guys came up with this model called the stage of change. Actually, it's the, the exact title would be the trans-theoretical model of change. And we started using that in the, uh, in the treatment center. Because what was happening is that, you know, this is a really action-oriented kind of world. You know, there's even phrases that say, actions speak louder than words, and I cannot trust you because I want to see your actions. So we developed programs around action. Non-smoking, you know, smoking cessation programs, uh, giving up uh, alcohol or drugs, changing any kind of behavior. You know, maybe you're, you like to rage, or maybe you're an impulsive spender or something like that. People want to see action. So all the programs are designed around that. Well, what was happening is that very few people would sign up and really commit to them, to these programs, because they weren't ready yet. 